Hi, I'm Reggie Warren, a Senior Principal Systems Engineer at Extreme Network. And for the next few minutes, I'm going to be talking about designing modern data center using IP fabrics. Now, we all know the reasons why new data centers are being built and the strategies from what they need to be built for. However, I'm going to focus on the how, the design and transition of the data center. How do you build out this new data center? How do you tie the old to the new and the automation that's required to meet the expected outcomes um, of this new data center? So with that said, let's get started. From the enterprise perspective, looking at the data center from, from the macro, we see that the data center touches many different networks. It reaches out to the campus network. It extends out into the cloud and to the internet. It also connects other legacy infrastructures that you may have. In addition, it may need to communicate with other data centers. So it's important that we take all of this into consideration when building out our data center. With that, we have to build a design checklist. And there's four different areas of that checklist. One area is a connectivity area, when we're actually looking at the total number of racks we need, the number of physical hosts that will go inside these racks, the number of hosts per racks, the type of network interface cards that would be part of these hosts, whether you're using virtualized servers or not. From the architecture perspective, once you have your total hosts that will be going in, you have to determine the topology that's being used to host this new data center, whether it's a small data center design or whether it's one that requires a three-stage or five-stage CLO architecture. In addition, you have to look at the oversubscription ratio and whether you'll be managing the network from an in-band or out-of-band perspective. Also, you have to look at the logical design, basically how many VLANs and VRS, MACs and ARP addresses on this. And if you plan on using network virtualization, such as BGP, EVPN, you have to determine how many VXLAN tunnels will be required. And lastly, you have to look at the automation. Is automation required to deliver day zero services for IP fabric deployments, day one services for adding tenants, and day two services for any add moves and changes? What about full life, full life cycle management support? or integrating with other ecosystem partners inside your data centers. What have to be considered at that point is programmatic interfaces into these ecosystem partners. So all this is a design checklist that you should consider when building out your data center. So the key point here is plan, plan, plan. It's very important that you spend the time in looking at this checklist and looking at all aspects of how this data center is connected to other infrastructures as you move in transition towards a new data center. So let's look at the physical design at this point. Now, first I'd like to show you extreme SLX um, portfolio of switches that we primarily use inside the data center space. As you can see here, you have a number of switches categorized from where they are placed inside the data center, whether you have leaf switches, or spine switches, core, border router, and border leaf switches. Now this is further categorized whether these switches are for shallow buffer and deep buffers. That becomes important later on in our discussion around um, connecting interfaces up with different speeds and why shallow buffering and deep buffering would matter at that point. With that, let's look at the physical topology. As I mentioned earlier, the physical topology, you have to look at the physical racks that's needed to host your new servers inside the data center. So here you have racks one through 11 as an example. In racks one through three, you would typically have a top of rack switch inside the data center. Here it's listed as a pair of switches. Now, in rack one through three, you would actually put all your hosts that have similar network interface cards of the same speeds inside this rack to have a higher efficiency of the use of ports with inside a top of rack switch. So here, for example, you have 30 hosts that has copper ports, that's one G page T, and you also have 50 hosts 
that are 10G base T copper ports. Here you will house them in the same rack. In racks four through 10, you will have hosts that has 150 10G interfaces that have optical connections into the network, as well as hosts that have 25 gig connections optically into your top of rack switches. And then in the final rack, you will have your border leaf or any other services in your data center inside this rack, such as your DHCP or DNS or firewall that will reside in the network. Now, these racks all have to communicate with each other. They communicate with another tier of switches called the spine layer. And these leafs or top of rack switches all connect into the spine. We go more into details what that spine does, but those spines can also sit within rack 11. So now we have the racks laid out, the switches that we have laid out in these racks. Let's look at other things that's required, such as oversubscription. Over in order to compute your network over subscription, you have to take a look at your compute links as well as your leaf uplinks on this network. It's a simple math calculation, but let's look at this from a 10 gig compute link perspective with 40 gigs on your network switches. With that, we have to add up all of your compute links. In this case, we have 10 gig links in our host we have a total of 96 ports. Simple math, uh, simple, uh, math will give us 960 gig of total bandwidth at the compute layer. Next, we'll look at all the bandwidth for your uplinks. In this case, we have four uplinks going from the leaf to the spine. The speed on those links are 40 gig. Again, another you know, math, simple math problem, and we have a total of 160 gig. Now we would take the total compute bandwidth divided by the total leaf bandwidth, and that will give us an oversubscription ratio of six to one. Typically for more, most modern data center deployments, you normally would see an oversubscription ratio anywhere from three to six. However, you may see some that requires a much lower oversubscription ratio. So let's look what happens when you use 100 gig uplinks. Use that same math, it drops from six to one down to four, 2.4 to one. So by adding 100 gig uplinks, you have a better oversubscription ratio. However, many modern day servers today get shipped with 25 gig links. Let's see what happens to your infrastructure, oversubscription ratio of your infrastructure using 40 gig links. It shoots immediately up to 15 to one. That's a huge oversubscription ratio, which may have an impact on the network performance of your data center. In order to resolve that issue, it may be best to go at 100 gig leaf uplinks, where we drop that oversubscription ratio back down to six to one. So as you move to 40 gig interfaces, uh, to actually 25 gig compute interfaces, it's probably best to move with 100 gig uplinks as part of your infrastructure. In addition, you can also improve your oversubscription ratio by adding more spines. This will also add more leaf uplinks into those spines. So now let's look at the underlay. There are building blocks to an IP fabric. First, the topology. The typical topology that you see is three stage cloth topology or five stage cloth topology. This, these topologies are based on whether you need to build a medium to large size data center deployment or a very large data center deployment. It's called three stage and five stage because of the number of switches a host has to communicate or have to traverse before it reaches its destination. But for those customers that need a small data center topology, Extreme also offers that topology as well, and it's not in your standard cloud topology. No matter which topology you use, an IP underlay of BGP is required with no additional inter-gateway protocols on the network. So BGP is primarily the only protocol that's required for the underlay 
across all these closed topologies. In addition to that, across these topologies, we also support an overlay network of using BGP, EVP, and control plane with VXLAN data plane encapsulation. This will allow you to communicate and extend layer two and layer three across the entire fabric. Now, let's look at this from a layer one perspective. As I mentioned, you have a spine layer and a leaf layer. The spine layer is used just to as transport for the leaf switches. So therefore, it's important that all the leaf switches attach to all the spines in the network. In addition to that, the leaf switches may have connections in between each other for um, clustering. And we'll go a little bit more further into that in just a minute. From a layer two perspective, we do auto discovery between your topology or between your switches in the IP fabric using LLDP. This will discover what spines and leafs exist in the network. In addition to layer two topology, I mentioned we use clustering at the leaf layer called MCT clustering. And what this allows is for a host that require dual connectivity into the fabric. From a layer three perspective, all our links and the switch links are using IP address slash 31 addresses, or they can be unnumbered IP addresses. In addition, the entire fabric is using BGP and no other protocols is required. As part of BGP, we're using private autonomous system numbers in which each rack whether the rack exists of one top of rack switch or a dual pair of top of rack switch has its own unique autonomous system number. And all the spines belong to one autonomous system number. Host routes are installed after auto, auto learning is done. Now let's look at host connectivity. And we talked a little bit about this as far as hosting connecting into the IP fabric. You may have some requirements for a host to be single attached into your, into your leaves. That's fine, but what about when you need connectivity for your host for redundancy, for a host that requires high availability? Well, you need to be able to attach two links into your top of rack um, switches. And, this, and these links have to be configured as, uh, as a logical virtual chassis across your network. Well, from the host perspective, we can use static lags for that or dynamic lags um, using LACP for that connectivity. And this will give you that high availability for your host connectivity into the IP fabric network. From a VLAN VRF perspective, it's important that we separate the traffic out. From an underlay perspective, that should go into its own default VRF. Once we start adding user VRF um, VLANs or VLANs and VE interfaces, that should be in its own separate VRF. This is such that so that traffic from the user VLANs don't impact traffic from the underlay network. Now for connectivity between different racks, we are using L2 VNIs or L3 VNIs for that connectivity. In addition, you see that static anycast gateway is required at the VLAN level. This static anycast gateway is defined at your top of rack switch. There is no need for any other protocols here, such as VRRP. Static anycast gateway is the same per VLAN VRE across your entire network. In addition to that, there's a default MAC that's consistent across the network that can be configurable. Now, that static anycast gateway is the entry point into your IP fabric network and is a requirement. Now, let's take a look at that overlay network and look at the considerations there. So our IP fabric is based off BGP EVPN. That is the control plane. And from the data plane perspective, we're using VXLAN encapsulation. 
In order to map these VLANs into your network virtualization, we're using VLANs to VNI or VXLAN network identifier mappings. Now, those VNIs have to be mapped to an EVPN instance in order to get into that IP fabric. Once it's there, we can extend L2 VNIs or L3 VNIs across the network. In addition, all MAC and IP learning is done via the control plane of the network. And that's everything to the, to the overlay networking. As you can see here, it's based off BGP. So it's very minimum configuration is required to um, EVPN to get the overlay up and going. So let's look at how L2 extension occurs across this IP fabric network. Here in this example, I'm looking at traffic flow from left to right. We have uh, two leaf switches that are in different racks that need to communicate each other. Each of these leaf switches have an EVPN instance that's already configured. Now I would like to add VLANs. In order to get this into our network virtualization network, I will have to map these VLANs to a VNI instance that will then get mapped into my EVI instance across the network. That traffic will be sent to the local leaf in which it will hit the virtual tunnel endpoint in which an encapsulation will occur and sent across a VXLAN tunnel to its destination leaf switch where the VTIP at that point would de-encaps that de-encapsulate that traffic and send it on to its VLAN. VLANs coming back the other way will go through that same process. We talked a little bit about configuration, the ease of configuration of getting the overlay network. Let's take a look at this from the CLI perspective of LEAF1. So as you can see here, first thing we have to look, do is look at the VTIP and see how that's defined. So here, most of the time, our VTIP is defined as loopback2 on the switch. Also, we have to map VLANs to VNI. This is done on the VXLAN configuration of the switch. As you can see here, you have map VNI auto. This is automatically taken care of for you, although you have the option to manually convert VN VLANs to VNI. In addition, you need your BGP underlay and your BGP overlay control uh, configuration for the switch. Here you have your underlay that's defined underneath address family IPv4. And for your overlay, it's underneath address family L2VPN. And lastly, you need your EVPN instance. And here within inside the EVPN instance, that's where you will add your VLAN to the EV, EVI. At this point, you may have some transient tunnels communicate because you're doing VTIP discovery. However, if you take a look at the switch itself, you may not see any tunnels that's up and operational at this point. That's because there are no requirements at this point for hosts communicating onto that VLAN. So now let's add a host inside VLAN 30. Once we do that, you will see a the tunnel automatically come up to all the hosts that are interested inside that VLAN and needs to communicate. You can show those tunnels from the CLI by doing show tunnel brief. And here you will see two tunnels that are up and that's communicating to those destination leaves. In addition, if you do show VLAN, show VLAN brief, you can see that your VLAN 30 is mapped to VNI 30 using two tunnel instances, tunnel 61441 and tunnel 61442. Now, from auto VTIP discovery, it's done a little bit different from a layer two network. So let's see how that's happening. So here you have a VLAN that's communicating to your EVI instance of your leaf switch. Once that occurs, that VLAN gets mapped to a VNI and gets added to that EVI, and a BGP update message of, of an IMR, which is an inclusive multicache route, with the VNI 30 and the 
And with the uh, next hop being the local VTIP IP address, that will get sent up from the leaf switch to the spine switch. The spine switch will then send that IMR route down to the leaf switch in the network. When a leaf switch receives these IMR, IMR routes, it will look at it to see whether v, it matches its own VNI. And if it matches its VNI, it will import that route and it will set BGP, it will set the next hop as the remote VTIP for BGP. At this point, your VXLAN tunnel will get established between those leaf switches. From a MAC and IP learning perspective, it uses slightly a different method. So say user one would like to communicate, say with user five in this case, you would do normal data plane learning at the top of rack switch, whereas that MAC will come into port one. Now, from an EVI perspective, once that uh, data traffic hits the, the IP fabric, it would then at that point um, capture for that particular MAC the IP address, the VNI that it belongs to, as well as a local VTIP. It will then send a, a BGP update from that leaf switch up to the spine switch with this information. That spine switch would then send out all its interfaces um, back down to the leaf switches inside the network with this, with this information. That information will be stored inside its local uh, MAC table entries. In addition, this information learning back the other way will occur. So instead of a broadcast mechanism where these MAC and IP addresses are learned, it's actually learned from a BGP update message, uh, specifically a route table two update for a BGP across this network. Now, let's look at VXLAN traffic distribution. As you can see, we have many links going from your top of rack switch up to your spines. Which link does it choose? Does it choose all of them? Uh, is there some sort of low sharing or low balancing across these links? Well, before I answer that question, let's look at this from a dual leaf pair or a pair of switches at the top of rack that is configured as an MCT cluster. Now that MCT cluster, each physically has its own virtual tunnel endpoint. However, since we're looking at those switches or combining that cluster as if it was one logical switch, we also combine in the VTIP as a logical VTIP. So therefore, there's only one VTIP for a pair of top of rack switches. Now, it will look at the number of links that are available to the spine and can use that using equal cost multipath. Now, we'll vary across those equal cost multipath links by the use of using a source UDP port to vary that traffic. Let's see how this occurs. Here is an encapsulated packet that's sent to the virtual tunnel endpoint. Let's specifically look at the destination MAC, and it's pointing to, to spine one. How did it choose spine one? Well, it chose spine one based off the source UDP hashing results um, for distributing traffic um, across these links. Once it chooses spine one, it will forward traffic up to spine one, and then spine one would then, using a hashing algorithm, determine which link it would use to send to its destination VTIP. In this case, it has two possible choices. It chose one. Based off this ha hashing algorithm, it can also choose the other one. Also, that logical VTIP, source VTIP, also have the option to send the traffic up towards spine two. And spine two, based off the hashing results, will determine which link it will send down towards its destination VTIP. So all links get used across an IP fabric, and it will be distributed based off equal cost multipath.
Now, one thing to note about routing across an IP fabric is that there's a, two ways to do it. But the switches themselves, to make sure that routing happens the most efficiently, has to support routing in and out of tunnels. Now, some switches do this in one single pass. Other switches may have to have two paths to route in and out that tunnel. You have to make sure that you are choosing the right switch. In extreme cases, all our switches support single pass riot or routing in and out of tunnels it's from an ASIC perspective. Now, once you choose the right switch in your network, there's two types of integrated routing and bridging, asymmetrical and symmetrical. With asymmetrical, you have to have common VLANs across your VRF stack. So you can see here, for communication for user one in VLAN 30 to communicate with user two in VLAN 50, I not only have to have uh, VLAN 50 in the user VRF top of rack switch, but also I have to have VLAN 30 there as well. The same thing I have to have for my destination VTIP as well, common VLANs across the VRF stack. Once that occurs, a packet is sent up to VLAN 30, there would be a lookup based off the destination IP. The stack at that point will route that traffic to VLAN 50. And VLAN 50, using L2 VNI, will bridge that traffic across the VXLAN tunnel to the destination VTIP, in which that traffic then will be forwarded out onto the VLAN. Now it's called asymmetrical integrated routing and bridging or IRB for short, because on ingress is doing a routing and bridging function and on egress is just doing a bridging function. Now, this may be great for small deployments, but for very large deployments that have all the VLANs present common across all your VRF stacks, you may have scaling issues. So we offer symmetrical integrated routing and bridging. And with symmetrical integrated routing and bridging, you don't have any common VLANs across your VRF stack. What you do have is a dedicated L3 VNI that will handle the VXLAN routing function. In this case, that dedicated layer three VNI is called VNI99. Let's see how this operates. User one in VLAN 70, now sends traffic to VLAN 70 inside your VRF stack. There would be a destination IP lookup and we find that that Destination IP exists behind VNI 99. So it will route from VLAN 70 to v, uh, VNI 99. It then will route that information across the L3 VNI to the destination VTIP, in which it will do another lookup and see that that MAC exists on VLAN 90. So there will be a routing function that will cause VNI 99 to route that to VLAN 90, at which there will be a de-encapsulation of the packet, and that will sent, be sent on to VLAN 90. Now, it's a metro because there's a routing function that occurs both at ingress and a routing function that occurs at egress. And it is used for large deployments in which you need that common VNI that will do all the routing functions on a VRF basis. Now, looking at this from a CLI perspective, looking at this from a CLI perspective, let's look to see how that's configured. And you see that that integrated routing and bridging, VE99, is configured under the VRF context. That means for every VE instance within a VRF, you have to have a dedicated L3 VNI defined. Now let's look at the border leaf. Now the border leaf is basically the gateway in and out of a data center fabric. However, it may connect to a number of other different networks 
inside your infrastructure. This may include uh, existing campus networks. This may include the internet. It may include some network services, such as firewalls or load balancers that exist on a network or other networks. So therefore, it's very important that your the router that you choose or the switch that you choose for your um, for your borderly supports um, enough buffers to make sure that uh, all the different interface link types that are connected to the borderly that there is no issue with performance of your traffic. However, how does the this borderly communicate to the IP fabric network? Well, the LEAF network has to advertise all its networks or VLANs to the border LEAF. That is done such that it can communicate, that border LEAF can communicate to other external networks outside of the IP fabric. This is a simple configuration that's done at the border LEAF where you are now redistributing all your connected links into BGP. Very simple configuration. Now that we took a look at the underlay and overlay of the network, let's also look at automating the network. And we're going to do this um, with EFA. EFA um, means extreme fabric automation. And extreme fabric automation is an automation application that extreme builds to now automate the orchestration of fabrics and tenant networks within inside your IP fabric. It's used as a single point for configuration of the entire fabric. And it's based on microservices. You see that there's a foundational microservice that exists that looks at asset, the fabric infrastructure, as well as the tenant services. So is a fully aware of the fabric and how it's configured and the tenant services that exist on that fabric. This becomes a simple and easy integration to other ecosystem partners that you may require for integration into um, the IP fabric infrastructure, such as OpenStack, VMware, and Microsoft Hyper-V. In order to add that integration, it's just adding another microservice onto the EFA application. Now, I just have a sample of some of that integration. There are additional microservices that can be deployed upon EFA. Now, this application can run on the switches themselves, the SLX switches themselves, with inside integrated application hosting environments. But for very large deployments, you may require to install EFA on a standalone server. In addition, Extreme Fabric Automation is an application or, or is treated as a feature for Extreme's IP Fabric deployments. Therefore, there's no extra cost to using Extreme Fabric Automation at all. Now I'm going to transition to a demo on how Extreme Fabric Automation is easy to use and how quickly it is to set up an IP Fabric as well as tenant services across the network. Here is an example of the topology that we will be using. It's using a three-stage CLO architecture, of which there are four switches. Two switches will be deployed as spines, and the other two as leaf. Each of these switches have a configured management IP address. The switches are racked and stacked and configured in the manner that you see. There are two configured hosts attached to each lead. The EFA application is already installed on a server. In this example, we'll be demonstrating the automatic provisioning of the IP fabric, both underlay and overlay, in addition to adding a tenant service that will allow host one to communicate across host two using network virtualization, specifically BGP eVPN. Let's get started. I have a terminal session into each of the devices on a network for visibility. At this point, there is no configuration of the fabric itself. 
So if I go to each of the switches on a network, I shouldn't expect to see any IP fabric configuration at all. Extreme IP fabric is based off BGP protocol. So let's go to Leaf1 to see if there's any BGP services configured. And there's nothing there. Just as a confirmation, let's take a look at any BGP services. And there's no BGP enabled. We should expect to see the same on Leaf 2, Spine 1, and Spine 2. Let's check. And as you can see, there are no BGP services across the fabric. Therefore, I should not be able to ping from host 1 to host 2. Let's check. I also shouldn't be able to ping from host 2 to host 1. Lastly, let's go to the EFA application to see if there's anything configured there. And as you can see, there is no fabric configured. So using EFA, let's start to automate the provisioning of this fabric. First, let's create a three-stage clove fabric called Fabric 1. Now, let's add our leaves and spines to this fabric. The fabric at this point is pre-provisioned. Let's commit the configuration of the fabric to the underlying infrastructure. At this point, the underlay and overlay of the fabric is provisioned. We can go check this. As you can see, we have BGP neighborship from the leaf to its spines. And the same is true of leaf 2 to its spines. And the spines, as you expect, should have BGP neighborship to the leaves. In addition, by looking at the BGP overlay, you can see that we have neighborships from the leaf 1 to spine 1 and spine 2. We also have our overlay established for leaf 2. However, at this point, since we have no tenant services deployed, we shouldn't have any tunnels across the fabric. And as you can see from leaf 1, there are no tunnels. Also, no tunnels on leaf 2. Since there are no tunnels, our hosts still should not be able to communicate with each other. Now, host 2. We are unable to communicate between the hosts. So now, let's go back to EFA and add our tenant services. Let's first start by creating a tenant. 
Now we want to assign this tenant within a BRF context. Lastly, we want to commit the configuration of this tenant. Now the tenant is fully deployed. Let's go check. Let's go to leaf one and take a look to see if there's any tunnels that are created. Oh, we do have a tunnel that's up. Let's go to leaf two. That tunnel is up as well. Let's also check the VLAN to virtual network identifier or VNI mapping, which allows that VLAN to be virtualized across the network. And as you can see, this VLAN 100 is mapped to VNI 100. And the same is true on leaf two. VLAN 100 is mapped to VNI 100. Now let's go to the host to see if we now are finally able to ping between each other. As you can see, host one is able to ping the host two. Let's go to host two. And the host two is also able to successfully ping the host one. The entire IP fabric was configured in a matter of seconds using Stream Fabric Automation application. Let's talk now about our transition strategy. Now I'd like to state again that it's imperative that you plan, plan, plan any IP fabric deployment and transition strategy. The key here is that we like to minimize any downtime and service outages. When we have the new data center fabric deployed, we can start standing up new services and then migrate existing services onto the new infrastructure. There's a number of different approaches of doing this. I will go through one phased approach on this transition strategy. Let's take an existing data center network. Now we deployed a new extreme IP fabric deployment, hopefully using extreme fabric automation. And if so, it was done in minutes, if not seconds. Once we have that new data center fabric, now we can connect the existing fabric to the new data center fabric at the border layer. Once we have that connection into the existing infrastructure, we can now start adding new servers onto the new infrastructure. Once we de finish deploying the new services, now we can start prepping the existing network as well as the new data center to transition all the services onto the new infrastructure. That's first done by configuring your VLANs of the new services um, where the old services exist. Once we have that configuration completed, we can now transition the old services onto the new infrastructure anywhere on that infrastructure, on the IP fabric infrastructure. Now, once we finish that transition of the old services onto the new infrastructure, we can now take the links connected to your core routers and swing that over from the existing data center onto your new infrastructure. Now, your existing data center can remain in place or um, there can be continued transition of uh, older services onto the new data center infrastructure at the customer's pace. Once that's complete, the customer can at one point decommission the existing data center and just move forward with the new IP fabric data center. So in conclusion, we talked about modernizing your, your, your data center using IP fabric networks. Extreme gives you that choice. There's several things that you have to keep in mind as a consideration. Your physical network or your physical topology, your underlay, your overlay, what automation application you're going to use, as well as your transition strategy. Extreme has a solid solution 
to help you migrate your data centers into the modern era using IP fabric technology. Thank you for watching.